Well, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight and to have the opportunity to give this uh, presidential uh, lecture for the year 2015. I think I have to thank very much to Humphrey for the invitation to come and even more for that uh, very generous uh, uh, introduction. It has been really difficult to choose what to say uh, tonight. Um, every time I had put the slides for this uh, talk together, I have ended up with too many stories to tell you. So I have done a lot of clearing and a lot of cleaning, and at the end I have ended up with what I think are the bare bones, the fundamental aspects of the things I would like to, to tell you tonight. Nevertheless, I still have too many slides. And if you think that this is the summer of 1971, this photograph was taken the day I gave my first uh, uh, presentation to the British Pharmacological Society in Oxford. And I'm sitting here with a great friend and collaborator and a great pharmacologist, uh, Sergio Ferreira, who was uh, one of the first people I met together with Mick Barclay when I came to the Royal College of Surgeons in uh, 1971. <coughs> so what I have decided to do is to talk for about 50 minutes. At the end of the 50 minutes, I will stop wherever I am in the talk and uh, there won't be any conclusions. In fact, there are no conclusions to this talk because it's all a work in progress. And I'm very surprised even that 40 years after we did some things, it remains a work in progress, as you will see uh, from the uh, content of my talk. As far as looking into the future, which is uh, Humphrey's addition to my, uh, to my <laughs> title, I will try to look into the future as I, as I go along. So let's see what we can, uh, we can do. And I think the best way to start is to start with a phrase and something that was written by Gadom in 1959, which describes the essence of, uh, of pharmacology. Gadom wrote in 1959 that new chemical methods have been described in recent years, which have been a great improvement on older methods. But he said also that they will only inspire universal confidence if they are shown to give the same results as, bio as biological methods. And I think in this time applies not only for the old chemical methods that were described many years ago, but the, the new methods, molecular biology included and the rest. In an era in which technology is driving science and technology itself is being driven by the interest of the companies which makes the machines and the machines offer you machines that can even answer questions that you have never asked. <laughs> I think it's important to remember that we are biologists, that we are interested in biological processes, and that we do very well in relying fundamentally on biological measurements. This is the cascade superfusion technique that was originally developed uh, by uh, Gadom that decided to put a tissue, uh, uh, instead of immersing it in the fluid, to drip the fluid of the tissue, and Vein then added several tissues in a cascade, which added several things to the system. <coughs> First, accuracy. Second, the possibility of fingerprinting substances. And third, which I often emphasize, the possibility of, if you know what you're doing, identifying uh, new substances that might you might not know the uh, fingerprint of. And this was the method that was absolutely instrumental in actually doing the experiments that solved the problem of the mechanism of action of aspirin in the early 70s. This is uh, one example that comes from the paper that we published with John and with, uh, with Sergio Ferreira, showing very clearly this uh, parallel bioassay in the effluent of an isolated spleen that was perfusing a bank of tissues. And you can see prostaglandin E2 given over the tissues, and then prostaglandin released from the spleen, which is inhibited by an infusion of indomethacin, and then it recovers after the end of the infusion. And I don't have time to go into the many details of this work, but suffices to say that this was part 
of the three papers that are the classical papers that describe the mechanism of action of aspirin. The pa paper by Vane on uh, homogenates of lungs, the paper that we uh, published together with John and Sergio in the, that I have cho just shown you a slide, and the paper by Smith and Willis uh, that is these days uh, not so often uh, quoted on, and recognized. That they, what they did, which was a beautiful uh, type of experiment, is they took aspirin themselves, they took then samples of the blood, as isolated the platelets, and showed that the prostaglandin production by the platelets was uh, inhibited. And these papers are the foundation on which the understanding of the mechanism of action of aspirin lies and has been built over the years. And we could have uh, uh, several symposia and several meetings of several days discussing the implications of this discovery, <coughs> but this did, I cannot even mention a part of the story because what I want to do is actually bring all this uh, work into the focus of uh, uh, vascular biology. And the way this was connected with vascular biology was very interesting because it was known since the uh, first days of aspirin that people who took aspirin developed a bleeding uh, disorder. Every time they took an aspirin there was an increase in bleeding, cutaneous bleeding or organ bleeding that was well recognized and over the years for example, in children who had tonsillectomies and were given aspirin as an analgesic, they bled more than the uh, children who did not uh, take aspirin. And this led to several other clinical observations until the point in which uh, this uh, doctor, a medical doctor, uh, observational uh, person, uh, published a little paper in 1953 suggesting that aspirin might be used as a uh, prophylactic uh, in the uh, problem of coronary thrombosis. I don't think he ever imagined how prophetic that uh, uh, little paper was or anybody even believed that that was going to be true. But it took several years from 1971 to actually understand what aspirin was doing in relation to uh, bleeding. It took several years and several discoveries uh, mainly made by the group of Samuelson in the Karolinska Institute to the understanding that arachidonic acid, which is the precursor, is, is converted by the cyclooxygenase into a group of compounds, mainly prostaglandin G2 and H2, which are called the cyclic endoperoxides, which are unstable, which then are converted into the uh, classical prostaglandins. And these are, uh, I uh, made them a bit faint here, because the main metabolic pathway of arachidonic acid in the platelets is actually from arachidonic acid through the cyclooxygenase into the cyclic endoperoxides to the formation of thromboxane A2. And while we were doing studies of the conversion of arachidonic acid into thromboxane A2, we actually identify and partially purify a new enzyme which we call thromboxane synthase. And the reason why I show it specifically is to look into the future. I think this enzyme has not been studied as extensively as it should be. The main reason is because aspirin is so effective in doing what it's supposed to be doing. But I think in the future there will be an interest, as you will, uh, will become clear from the rest of my lecture, in trying to find inhibitors of this enzyme with therapeutic potential. Now, if you take aspirin, what actually happens is that uh, there is inhibition of the whole pathway below the cyclooxygenase and the formation in the case of platelets of that uh, very powerful uh, vasoconstrictor and prothrombotic agent thromboxane A2. And this is just to show you some of the original work done at the time of bioassay in which we were comparing the activity of the prostaglandin endoperoxides on a bank of bioassay tissues with the product of those endoperoxides incubated with a microsomal enzyme generating thromboxane A2. I have a problem with this. And you can see very clearly the different pharmacological profile 
of a large dose of the prostaglandin and doperoxide compared to thromboxane A2, which is a pure uh, vasoconstrictor agent. And <coughs> prostaglandin A2, that doesn't have an effect on this tissue. Not only is a vasoconstrictor, but thromboxane A2 is a powerful pro-aggregating agent, as you can see here. These are platelets treated with an inhibitor of the cyclooxygenase, and we are inducing aggregation on the platelets with different concentrations of the prostaglandin and doperoxides, and then taking 100 nanograms of G2, converting into thromboxane A2, and you can see how much more powerful the aggregation is. So let me show you a cartoon of what is the situation. And I show it to you <coughs> to simplify things. Uh, this is a transfer cut of a vessel. If we take, for example, the red cells and the, and the, and the white cells, and we leave the platelets and cut the vessel, what actually happens is that platelets emit the pseudopodia, produce aggregates, and form the hemostatic plug. This is the physiological function of platelets to plug hemostatically the cuts in the vessels, and it's a survival mechanism. If there is enough thromboxane A2, you have in addition to that a vasoconstriction. Now I show, it, I show this to you for several reasons. First, because this is a basic fundamental uh, mechanism, that, uh, which is hemostasis. Secondly, because changing what has to be changed, this is the basic mechanism which is responsible for the formation of arteriosclerotic plaques. The platelets aggregate into a damaged vessel wall, which is not cut, but damaged. And third, because it was important to me for what I'm going to tell you uh, uh, now. So the thromboxane A2 imitates uh, when it's producing an arteriosclerotic plaque, actually the mechanism resembling the formation of the hemostatic plaque. And it was while doing this type of experiments, we were measuring cutaneous bleeding time in the tail of a rat, and I was looking under the microscope. It takes three minutes for the hemostatic plaque to form. But very often under the microscope, when we were cutting the vessel, it would close very often immediately and stay like that before the hemostatic plug was formed. And I thought that probably the vessel wall was also making thromboxane A2, and that we should investigate whether the vessel wall was making thromboxane A2, what would synergize with the thromboxane A2 from the platelets to make the hemostatic plug. And I suggested to John and the other colleagues that we should go now change from platelets and make a microsomal preparation from vessel walls and try to see whether we could see the formation of thromboxane A2. When Stuart Bunting and I started to do the experiment, we realized that actually there was an enzymatic reaction, that we had prepared an enzyme that was converting the endoperoxide into something that we could not identify in the classical bank of bioassay tissues. It didn't make thromboxane, but it didn't make any of the classical prostaglandins either. And we were very lucky with Stuart because we were at that time playing with a specific uh, uh, strip of vessel, which was the bovine coronary artery. At that time, it was believed that the vessel wall made prostaglandin E2. And we did an assay of prostaglandin E2 versus what we started to call PGX. And we found that although it was difficult to differentiate them in the classical bioassay tissues, they had the opposite effect on the bovine coronary artery. <coughs> While prostaglandin E2 produced a contraction, the PGX that we call produced a relaxation. And we, because it was unstable also, we knew that we had discovered a new substance. Now the important moment came a few weeks later when we started to think that we were looking for a vasoconstrictor and a pro-aggregating agent, thromboxane A2. And we have stumbled on the effect of a compound that had vasodilator activity. And I thought, well, why not the equation complete? We were looking for a pro-aggregating vasoconstrictor. We might have found a vasodilator, which is inhibitor of platelet aggregation. And Stuart and I decided to do the experiments and this is what I always call the Eureka moment, because as soon as we incubated the endoperoxides, 
with the uh, microsomal fraction for the vessel from the vessel wall, we could generate an inhibition of platelet aggregation which was much greater than anything we had known at the time. Prostaglandin E1 was the most potent inhibitor of aggregation and you can see these 50 nanograms producing a slow reduction in aggregation and this is what we more or less calculated at the time we were making of PGX 1, 2, 3 and 4 nanograms and you can see the powerful inhibitory effect. So that was a very significant finding because we had found the exact opposite in the vessel wall to what we had been looking for. And that created the situation and the basis for a lot of work that has taken place over the last uh, 40 years or so. Because what we actually discover <coughs> is that arachidonic acids can be converted to the cyclic endoperoxides by two different types of enzymes, those cyclooxygenases. One in the platelets that makes thromboxane A2 and one in the vessel wall which made PGX which we later identified as prostacyclic. And the question from the very beginning which continues being discussed today is what happens to a vascular system in which you give enough aspirin to block the two pathways. What is the status of a vascular system that receives an aspirin? Because what I started to think at the time and we started to suggest in our reviews is that there is a balance in the cardiovascular system of pro and anti-thrombotic mechanisms. If the system goes in favor of thromboxane, there will be a pro-thrombotic situation. If the system, on the other hand, moves in favor of prostacycline, you will have an, uh, an anti-thrombotic situation. But when you inhibit the two, at the moment it's not very clear exactly what might be uh, 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 happening. The case of aspirin was solve itself because aspirin turned out to be a fantastic inhibitor for the enzyme in the platelets. Is 40 to 60 times more active as an inhibitor of the platelet cyclooxygenase than the vessel wall cyclooxygenase. And not only that, since the platelets are not real cells and cannot make new proteins, once you take an aspirin, there is an inhibition for the rest of the life of those platelets for about 10 days. And that has been the basis for the fantastic uh, success of aspirin as a potential antithrombotic agent, as you will see later on. Because what aspirin in small doses does is to shift the pathway in favor of an antithrombotic situation, taking away thromboxane A2 and uh, facilitating or allowing the release of prostacyclic. And this is the basis for all the clinical trials that have taken place in the last 25 years or so using small dose of aspirin and all the meta-analysis that actually show that aspirin is protective. Our own way of showing that in 1978 was to take aspirin ourselves to measure our own cutaneous bleeding time and compare if we bled more when we took a small dose of aspirin than if we took a larger dose of aspirin. And we published that in The Lancet and you can see very clearly that the small aspirin has a greater capacity to make you bleed, suggesting that it will have a better a potentially greater antithrombotic effect. And these are the summary of some of the uh, meta-analysis in the clinical trials and it's clear that uh, aspirin uh, prevents stroke in patients with arteriosclerosis and transient ischemic attacks, reduces the risk of myocardial infarction in unstable angina, reduces mortality in acute myocardial infarction and prevents occlusion of the uh, vein grafts. Because it's so effective, the use of aspirin now has become widespread. And it's calculated that between 250 and 350 million people in the world are taking small doses of aspirin as primary prevention for cardiovascular disease. And the question has always been, is it doing the job if you don't have any risk factors? And if it's not doing the job, what's the kind of risk you have of bleeding? Aspirin, even in small doses, can make you bleed from the stomach. And this has only been solved very recently 
with different type of studies which are summarized here in a review by Carlo Patrono, showing <coughs> first the benefit, number of patients whom a major vascular event is avoided per thousand in a year, unharmed, here we go again, unharmed, the number of patients whom a major bleeding event is caused and if you are a low risk person, you have the possibility of uh, preventing one to three in a thousand and make bleed one to two in a thousand. But as in the different situations in which you have risk factors like essential hypertension, chronic stable angina, prior myocardial infarction, unstable angina, you can see the protection is much greater than the uh, risk of bleeding. And therefore at this stage, the, in the absence of cardiovascular risk, there is no uh, yet clear indication that the risk-benefit ratio of taking a small aspirin is uh, justified. In fact, in the last few weeks, the FDA had issued recommendations suggesting that aspirin as primary prevention in people who don't have any risk factors is justified in people between 50 and 59 where there is showing that there is some positive effect above 59 or below 50 the indications are that there is no clear uh, data so far. So the situation became even more interesting in the 1990s <laughs> when two cyclooxygenases were uh, discovered. First, it was clear that there was a cyclooxygenase which was called cyclooxygenase 1, which has a constitutive enzyme uh, 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 encoded by one gene, and that was the uh, one generating prost prostaglandins in platelets and in the gastrointestinal tract. And then there was a second cyclooxygenase uh, encoded by a different gene, which was appearing in inflammatory conditions in cells which are migrating in inflammatory fluids and so on. And the idea then developed that it would be possible to develop a COX inhibitor, a COX-2 inhibitor, because the other, the traditional compounds, we did not know how they did in relation to the two enzymes, but the idea was that if we develop one that will block only this, we are going to have anti-inflammatory uh, without uh, side effects. And the pharmaceutical industry spent millions and millions of dollars developing these type of compounds which were actually made and have proven that indeed they have anti-inflammatory effects, that they have reduced side effects, but it's always a problem, a spanner in the, in the wheel. In 1999, Fitzgerald in the United States showed very clearly that if you take the COX-2 inhibitors, you inhibit a prostacycline which is present in the vasculature and that leads to the development of cardiovascular side effects. I always tell this story because a few weeks before this paper was published, I got a phone call from John Wallace from Canada and he said to me, I'm working with these COX-2 inhibitors and every time I give them for more than 10 days or so, the animals start developing hypertension. Did you ever see hypertension with aspirin or indomethacin in the animals? I said no. So it was something new that was being observed by these compounds and was the result of an inhibition of the COX-2 uh, in, the, in the vasculature. So what basically happens is that the COX-2 inhibitors, what they do is exactly the opposite of a small dose of aspirin. Because what they do is to inhibit the COX-2 in the vessel wall and they spare the formation of thromboxane A2. And that leads to the side effects and to the problems that all these compounds have uh, shown, including so big that some of them have to be withdrawn uh, from the market in a post-marketing uh, situation. This is an effect of a class of compounds, is not an effect of one of them. All of them share this uh, risk and you can see here where in a table which in which uh, White and uh, collaborators put not only the traditional non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs but the COX-2 inhibitors showing the increased risk over the non-users 
if you take a COX-2 inhibitor and you can see that it's clearly dose related because if you take rof rofecoxib at one dose and you double the dose, the risk increases. Now the idea now is that we don't have separate COX-1 and COX-2 compounds. We have a variety of compounds that have ratios of activity against COX-1 and COX-2. And the cleanest one in relation to COX-1 type effect is naproxen, for example, and aspirin. And on the other side, you have the most effective uh, a COX-2 inhibitor. And the cardiovascular side effects relate directly to the inhibition of the COX-2 enzyme. But not always things are all bad. In fact, this has been the, one of the most interesting developments. <coughs> because the inhibition of this inflammatory COX-2 has opened a whole new can of worms and a whole new uh, range of possibilities in terms of therapies. And the discussions has restarted in terms of the possibility of inhibiting specifically this COX-2 enzyme with potential benefits in all these conditions, uh, including cancer, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson, and so on and so forth. And there are studies in all these areas trying to investigate whether specific COX-2 inhibition might have a protective effect. But the only one I'm going to talk to you is cancer, because cancer has been so, so successful, the inhibition of COX-2, that now is becoming one of the hottest areas of therapy, especially in cancer research, and is spilling into the uh, 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 lay press. The last one I got, uh, an article which I saw, is this in the Daily Telegraph, the 2nd of November, a few weeks ago, talking about aspirin and cancer, aspirin and cancer, and so on. And it was very clear from the beginning of the study that aspirin or inhibition of COX has an effect protecting the conversion of polyps in the gut into neoplasia. Familial polyposis is the basis for the development, or at least one of the bases for the development of neoplasia in the gastrointestinal tract. And the since the 1990s, there was some indication on population studies that using COX inhibitors, the, the traditional compounds, might be protecting against cancer. But the first study that was done, the, uh, uh, a proper study for, with a thousand patients that were followed, given aspirin, was done by Barron in 2003 and showed very clearly that people who were taking aspirin for three years were protected against the development of cancer in the gastrointestinal tract. Since then, things have moved on enormously, and there is evidence that probably other forms of cancer are related in the early stages to the development of this inflammatory COX-2, including prostate, breast, lung, and yesterday when I was coming in the train from Manchester, I saw an article showing that in melanoma, there is a stage in the early disease in which there is a presence of COX-2 with the activation of the mechanism that might be leading to neoplastic transformation. So how, what, what does it actually happen? What seems to happen is that for some reason there is appearance of a COX-2 enzyme in the, in, the, in the polyps, which is part of a general inflammatory mechanism, that if, you, if that happens, the COX-2 plays a fundamental role in activating pro-survival pathways and pro-proliferative pathways in the cells and the beginning of a neoplastic transformation that in many cases is related to the overexpression of epidermal growth factor uh, 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 receptors. If you take the COX-2 away, it has been shown in experimental studies and in humans, and you take the polyps, the EGFR is significantly reduced. So the basis for this suggestion is that COX-2 inhibitors will inhibit the transformation of the polyp into neoplasia by inhibiting the presence of a COX-2, which is synergizing with other mechanisms to feed into the processes of neoplastic transformation. There is a problem. The problem is, of course, that the COX-2, I told you, have side effects. 
and have cardiovascular side effects. And that brings us back again to aspirin, which is the magic pill of the 20th century. Because several studies were done with COX-2 inhibitors, which show actually that indeed the COX-2 would prevent the development of neoplasia in gastrointestinal, in the gastrointestinal tract. But these studies, which led to the approval of one of the compounds for the prevention of cancer, the company later voluntarily withdrew the indication because of the problems of the side effects. So that leaves aspirin and all the studies mainly done by Rothwell and his group which are fascinating for several things. First, it shows clearly that aspirin protects also. Secondly, very interesting, that it doesn't protect immediately. You have to take aspirin for longer than five years to start showing the protective effect in the development of neoplasia from polyps. But the third thing which is fascinating is that small doses which don't inhibit the COX-2 also protect as well as the large doses. This is just to show you <coughs> that indeed if you do the same type of study in terms of effect of daily low dose aspirin on risk incident of cancer and major vascular events, you can see that the benefit from taking aspirin takes long time to develop, but is there and very clearly indicated and recognized now. And the major uh, vascular events do not increase with time of exposure. So the recommendation of the FDA is that if you are between 50 and 59 and you are ready to take aspirin for 10 years and you don't have risk for bleeding, you should be taking a small uh, dose of aspirin <coughs> to prevent cardiovascular disease and also to prevent the uh, potential development of uh, neoplasia. But how does a low uh, dose of aspirin work if it's not inhibiting COX-2? And this way comes a beautiful story that, if it's true, is going to be fascinating in terms of further research, in terms of further translational research. The hypothesis now is that probably damage of the polyps leads to activation of platelets. And the activation of platelets release factors, including thromboxane A2, <coughs> that will actually activate the inducible enzyme. It has been known for several years that platelet products are able to induce the expression of a COX-2 in endothelial cells. If that's the case, then that will be the connection between platelets and the COX-2 and cancer. And that's why low doses of aspirin will be as good as the COX-2 inhibitors because we'll, they will be inhibiting the activation of the pathway at an earlier stage. And if all that is true, then platelets become the center, a very interesting center, of the two major conditions that affect the world uh, at the moment, cardiovascular disease and cancer. And that unifies the whole thing. If it's true, there is an enormous potential of research there and also to go back to the thromboxane synthase that I was telling you before. Because it's well known the effect of uh, platelets in arteriosclerosis, not only the continuous platelet aggregation on a vessel wall which is damaged is able to lead to the development of the plaque, but the final major event, whether it is stroke or heart attack, is related clearly to platelet aggregation. But now in cancer, there are two things which are being investigated. That platelets play a role in the formation of the primary tumor, as I have just explained to you, by activating pro-survival pathways, like EGFR receptors, but also, and this is very interesting, because again, the idea was in the literature for about 15 years, when a metastatic cell from the tumor invades the vascular system, it looks as if the platelets come and cover and protect the cancer cell from immunological destruction. 
and they carry the cell until it goes to the niche of the tissue that metastasizes. So it looks as if if you inhibit platelet aggregation, what you do is you leave the cancer cells naked and the immunological system will do its job. And there is now increasing evidence that there will be an inhibition, that inhibition of platelet aggregation will also inhibit the meta metastatic potential of cancer. So there are two areas there of great interest and development at the moment. Let me finish this part, which would be half of my talk, <laughs> by, <coughs> by talking just two minutes about prostacycline. Uh, this is the structure of prostacycline, and this is the first uh, 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 vial of the first experimental batch, which was made by Trevor Jones at Wellcome in 1978. He gave it to me as a patent holder for the uh, discovery of prostacycline. Uh, and prostacycline has been the opening of a big story, especially in the treatment of primary pulmonary hypertension, where it is still uh, being used. Prostacycline was used originally on its own, but it's difficult to use because it's unstable. Then it was developed as, a, as an int uh, intravenous and also as a nasal application. And then several uh, uh, analogs were developed. And Brendan Whitley is here, who is responsible for identifying the prostinil, which is now uh, widely used. Then we have tried endothelin receptor antagonists and phosphodiesterase inhibitors. And the latest development is the development of selective prostacycline receptor agonist and soluble guanylate cyclase uh, uh, agonist that might you be used in the future as combination treatment. The interesting thing about these treatments is, is it looks as if you treat for long enough, you might be inhibiting the remodeling which is taking place in this particular uh, disease in primary pulmonary hypertension and not only stop the development of the disease but probably reverse it and that is what is hoped in the trials which are at the moment uh, are being carried out. So, while though all this was happening, Furch got published this paper in 1980. And everybody knows about this beautiful experiment, again by us, I haven't shown you a single Western blot yet. Uh, Furch got published this, pap this paper showing that if he had a ring of a vessel which was carefully prepared such that the endothelium was still there, and he contracted it with noradrenaline, acetylcholine <coughs> would produce relaxation. But if he took the endothelium off, and he used to use a pipe cleaner to clean the vessel inside, then the, endo the tissue would not relax with acetylcholine. And he called this endothelium-dependent relaxation. And isolated, identify a soluble compound, very unstable, that he called endothelium-derived relaxing factor. And for the next few years, many laboratories confirmed this finding and also <laughs> the fact that what, there was a transferable factor that do you could identify as EDRF. I was never very happy with cleaning the vessel with a pipe cleaner. I thought it was a bit, a bit too, too much. And I decided that we had all the experience working with <coughs> unstable products of arachidonic acid. Why not we try to make a system that would uh, 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 bioassay properly the EDRF? And we did this. We cultured vascular endothelial cells in a modified chromatography column. We perfused them and used the superfusate to perfuse a cascade of assay tissues, all of them vascular tissues. And we measured very carefully the distance between each of the tissues so we knew exactly how long it took to travel from one uh, 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 vial to the other. So we would do bioassay, and we had the endothelial cells, and very beautifully we could show, and this is a beautiful bioassay done by Richard Palmer. You can see the responses to nitroglycerin in the tissues. If you give nitroglycerin, it relaxes. The tissues is stable for seven seconds. If you then activate the cells with bradykinin, you release a factor that disappears very rapidly down the cascade. And if you try nitric oxide, and nitric oxide has been suggested as a potential 
EDRF by Furchgott. If you try nitric oxide, they travel and they have a half-life which is exactly the same. And many different experiments, not only in vessels but in platelets, led us to believe that from a pharmacological point of view, EDRF and nitric oxide was the same thing. But we were not happy with that and we developed a welcome uh, chemiluminescent system that measures directly nitric oxide, a system which has been now uh, universally used for the measurement of, uh, of, of nitric oxide. And we managed to measure the quantities of nitric oxide released by the endothelial cells and they were enough to explain the actions of EDRF and we published that in 1987 uh, before anybody else actually. Uh, What we did a year later was to identify the metabolic pathway leading to the synthesis of nitric oxide. We, I don't have time to explain to you why we came to that conclusion, but the idea was that arginine was the metabolic precursor for EDRF. And what we did uh, uh, was to, instead of having a small column of 30 to 40 million endothelial cells, we bought a large column uh, and we c cultivated instead of 30 million, five or 750 million cells in those carriers and we connect them directly to the mass spectrometer. And while we were infusing either uniformly labeled or guanidine or labeled arginine, which is labeled only here, we activated with bradykinin and we could see the signal of nitric oxide. And since the amounts we would get in the two type of experiments were the same, we came to the conclusion that nitric oxide is actually made from the guanido nitrogen atoms of L-arginine, these two terminal here, and that led us to identify the pathway which we call the L-arginine to nitric oxide pathway, in which you can see here, uh, this uh, goes in several steps through the formation of intermediates which incorporate oxygen, and then the formation of L-citrulline which is the co-product of the formation of nitric oxide. During those studies, either is this too small or my finger is too big or <laughs> there's something that doesn't fit here. We identify the first inhibitor of this pathway, a compound which is a monomethylated version of L-arginine and this compound has become the most important pharmacological tool and biochemical tool to identify the roles of nitric oxide in many different biological systems. I will just show you one experiment because it's one of my favorite ones and I don't have time to tell you how we got into that, but if you inject this inhibitor into an animal, an anesthetized animal, the animal develops a hypertension immediately, as you can see here. And that can be reverted by giving L-arginine to the animal. We already knew at that point that if we infuse LNMMA into an isolated uh, perfused heart, we would get vasoconstriction. And then when Patrick Valens joined me uh, in our laboratory, we decided to test it in humans and we injected M LNMMA into our own brachial arteries and measured by plethysmography a forearm blood flow. This is an experiment that Patrick Valens did uh, uh, and you can see clearly that if you give LNMMA to humans you produce a very significant vasoconstriction. The story is not here that you produce vasoconstriction. The story is that LNMMA is not a vasoconstrictor. LNMMA is taking away a normal physiological vasodilator tone and that suggests that the cardiovascular system in mammals at least is continuously dilated by the presence of nitric oxide and what has been shown later on that we suggested is that when the heart pumps the vascular system opens for the blood to go through if not the resistance would be too much and my suggestion at the time is that the cardiovascular system is in a state of active constant vasodilatation and that the main parameter which controls the vascular system 
is not resistance, as it has been believed for about 100 years, mm -hmm. but it's actually conductance, that we have to see the system the other way around, and there are changes in conductance, which is the changes in nitric oxide tone, which actually determine the state of the vascular system. Because there is so much molecular biology these days, and so little physiology and pharmacology, that concept has not been explored uh, to the full extent in the last 15 or 20 years. Nitric oxide is also an inhibitor of platelet aggregation. Nitric oxide is also an inhibitor of white cell activation. And because of that, the suggestion was that nitric oxide or lack of nitric oxide might play a role in a number of vascular diseases, including uh, uh, hypertension, vasospasm, and so on. I don't have time to go into the details of this, but there is evidence that actually the lack of nitric oxide is significant a biochemical mechanism which is significant in the development of the diseases. But where there is more significant is in early disease. And I think this concept is fundamental, which is the concept of endothelial dysfunction. For about 20 years, people have been talking about endothelial dysfunction. And this is a biochemical lesion which appears long before cardiovascular disease appears and can be measured, the response of the vascular endothelium response are decreased and has been linked to the lack or the decrease in nitric oxide production. I think that's a narrow definition. Probably endothelial dysfunction will have many other factors that at the moment are being overlooked because of the interest in nitric oxide, but endothelial dysfunction is also linked to something which is becoming a great area of interest, which is oxidative stress. Oxidative stress, we don't know what it is, but we use it all the time and we talk about balance between anti and pro-oxidant mechanisms and there is still a lot of work to be done before we actually understand what we mean when we talk about uh, uh, oxidative stress. But endothelial dysfunction, the early disease, is linked to the possibility of oxidative stress. And that brings us to another discovery that we made even one year before we identify EDRF. We were trying to identify what EDRF was. It was very unstable. And we came to the conclusion that it might be a free radical. And we started to try substances to see if we could enhance the half-life. And in one of those experiments, we used superoxide dismutase. And this is another beautiful bioassay. And we found that superoxide dismutase is able to enhance the half-life of EDRF with the, uh, of uh, DDRF and nitric oxide down the cascade. This is nitric oxide authentic. This is nitric oxide released from the cells. This is in the presence of an infusion of superoxide dismutase. And you can see very clearly how the half-life is increased. And we came to the conclusion and suggested that superoxide anions play a fundamental role in the destruction of endothelium derived uh, relaxing factor or nitric oxide. About a year later, we found that if you activate white cells, they will release both nitric oxide and oxygen, especially superoxide, and there will be an interaction between the two that will neutralize the action of each of them. And we didn't know what was the product of that reaction. It took uh, the work of Beckman in 1919 to show that the interaction between these two compounds lead to the formation of a very powerful pro-oxidant agent called <coughs> uh, peroxynitrite, which now has been identified as being present in a number of uh, uh, pathological conditions in humans, and in laboratory animals, atherosclerosis, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, myocarditis, chronic renal failure, and so on and so forth. So there is, in all these inflammatory conditions, the presence of this very powerful peroxynitrite. And at the moment, I think the investigation is still going on in terms to identify what is the actual role that this compound might play in all of these situations. The question is, where do the free radicals come from? And do we produce free radicals normally? And we became 
interested in the platelets because in 1994, working with Victor Dali Usman at the Welcome, we discovered that if we look at the cell and we look at the mitochondria, nitric oxide interacts with one specific enzyme in the mitochondria in competition with oxygen. And this interaction turns out to be very interesting because this is the enzyme where all the ATP is generated which for the energy of the cell. It is significant for three things. The interaction between oxygen and nitric oxide is always reversible and it occurs at physiological concentrations of the two gases. And third, which is fascinating, is the uh, mitochondria are much more interested in nitric oxide than in oxygen. The affinity of the enzyme for nitric oxide is so much greater that 60 nanomolar of nitric oxide is able to inhibit the respiration uh, of the cell by 50% at concentrations of 30 micromolar oxygen, which are physiological. So you have always the possibility in the mitochondria that nitric oxide is regulating the bioenergetic status. By, uh, by regulating the uh, consumption of oxygen. But the other thing that we show is that if you increase nitric oxide, as it happens in certain situations, there is the release of electrons from the oxidative uh, respiratory chain, the formation of superoxide, and then the transformation of superoxide as uh, a hydrogen uh, peroxide, as a signaling mechanism. I said I would talk for 50 minutes. I think I will finish there. This is a very interesting story. Uh, one of the things which is fascinating is that we found that if you inhibit respiration for long enough, then the inhibition of complex four, which is the enzyme I show you, becomes inhibition of complex one because there is oxidative stress. And what we found is that the triad of inhibition of complex one oxidative stress and the reduction of glutathione levels has been found in conditions in the central nervous system like Parkinson's disease and that was the opening of another story. We found that if you inhibit respiration for long enough, the complex one which is flipping back and forward between an active and the active phase, when it becomes the active, an SH group comes out and nitric oxide is able to nitrosylate this group and then it's fixed. At the time we said this could be a mechanism of protection because when you reoxygenate the blood will not bring the oxygen into the cell or the beginning of a situation in which oxidative stress will increase. There's beautiful work now coming out from Cambridge uh, by Michael Murphy showing not only that we were right but the implications of this are uh, fascinating. Let me leave you with one final concept, which is the one that is becoming very popular and very well studied. If you inhibit mitochondria, and you produce a mitochondrial defect, the cell immediately goes through a number of adaptations, including glycolysis and so on and so forth. And we call that situation metabolic hypoxia. The oxygen is there, the tissue cannot use it. Different from hypo hypoxia when this oxygen is not there. And we said the best example of this is septic shock. In septic shock there is not a problem of blood pressure because you restore blood pressure and people die. It's not a problem of perfusion because you can increase perfusion and the people die. It's the problem that the tissue can metabolically not use the oxygen you are giving it because there is a mitochondrial defect. We said this is the extreme example but it's possible that in chronic inflammatory conditions or degenerative condition, a similar metabolic defect, not as exaggerated as septic shock, 